This morning, sermon number five, um, as we continue our forgiveness series in the book of Romans uh, for this morning, chapter 12, verses 19 to 21, says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Many years ago, or some years ago, Chuck Colson, many of you will remember, was the convicted Watergate defendant. Uh, he is uh, the, now the president of Prison Fellowship Ministries, and he traveled with a group of Christian laymen to Indiana State Penitentiary. Uh, Colson, while he was there, took 20 companions, and they were conducting a worship service there for some of the inmates on death row. At the end of that service, uh, Colson and uh, those with him were allowed to pray individually with the inmates. As they were preparing to leave, uh, Chuck Colson was drawn uh, to the attention of a convicted murderer who was wait, awaiting execution, and then the Christian volunteer who was with Colson that day as they accompanied the prisoner uh, to uh, being returned to their cells, uh, Colson noticed that the volunteer who was with him was still with this uh, uh, murderer who was waiting on execution, and uh, they needed to go because their time was up, and, and the uh, warden was waiting to escort uh, uh, the uh, inmates back to their cells. And so they, um, uh, Chuck Colson kept uh, asking for the volunteer to please come on. And in response, the volunteer asked Chuck this question. He says, please, can you wait just a few minutes? You see, I am Judge Thomas Dodge, and I sentenced this man, Henry Lewis, to die. And he said, I need some time to talk with him and uh, to forgive him of the death threats that he made against my family and me during the time that I sentenced him. And since that time, this uh, death row inmate has become a Christian, and he wants to ask my forgiveness as well. Please give me just a few more minutes with him. And uh, as they stood there that day, uh, and uh, even on a personal level, they forgave each other, but it didn't take away the consequences of the man's sins. You see, one of the big myths that we have looked, uh, uh, looked at in one of our sermons on forgiveness is just because somebody forgives, does that free the offender of uh, consequences of their actions? And so some people will say, if I forgive such and such for such and such that was done to me, then that is taking away the consequences of that person's actions. And of course, that is one of the great myths that people use in order to say, I am not willing to forgive my offender. Uh, <clears throat> or let me give you some illustrations. <clears throat> Pardon me. In a divorce situation, say the husband has committed a, an adulterous affair. <clears throat> and so the wife and he get a divorce. <clears throat> She's left with three children, and he gets on with his life, but he's paying a steep uh, a child support payment a month. He goes on, and he marries, and, and uh, <clears throat> the ex-wife says she has forgiven him because of what he has done to her. And uh, now the husband with his new wife uh, feels that he's being crushed by these heavy child support payments. And so he goes to the ex-wife and he says to her, you know, I'm being crushed to death. This is too much of, a, of an amount of money for me to pay you a month. Uh, you said you forgave me for what I did to you, so why can't you relieve me of some of the responsibility of, of this debt? You see, the problem there is do, does forgiveness by the ex-wife, does that 
uh, reduce the husband's consequences for the actions of what he had done. Or take, for example, a church treasurer and say they embezzle some money and they're caught and they're confronted and uh, they are, are brought before the leaders of the church and they publicly confess their sin. They ask for forgiveness and they pay restitution back for the stolen goods. The question then comes, does that entitle that individual to be reinstated once again to be the church treasurer or does that person have to suffer the consequences of their own sin? Or perhaps this one. Consider the woman who's been sexually abused by an uncle as she was growing up. And even though he never asked forgiveness, she chose on her own benefit to forgive him, to unilaterally and to unconditionally forgive this uncle for perpetrating these sexual abuse acts upon herself. One day, her aunt, the uncle's wife, suspects that her husband has been involved in some type of immorality, though she's not aware of any specific thing, and so she confronts the niece. And she, with this observation, she says, I've noticed that you've been somewhat standoffish to Henry. I must ask you a very personal question. Has he ever offended you in any way? The question is this, should the niece, should she answer the question knowing that it could lead to a breakup of her aunt and uncle's marital relationship? Possibly if there are other offenses out there that he's committed, it could lead to him going to prison. Or should she just deny to her aunt her uncle's impropriety to her and just let it go with that? You see, the uh, answer, should the woman, should the woman, just knowing that she has forgiven him, does that do away with the consequences of what the uncle did to her? You see, in each of those three instances this morning, in the, the case of the husband who committed adultery, and uh, in the case of the church treasurer who embezzled the money, and in the case of the niece who was sexually abused by the uncle, all of them forgave the one who offended them, but did it do away with the consequences of the sins they imparted to the person they offended? Have I truly released that person? Have I automatically released them from the consequences of their actions? You see the question, does forgiving someone release them from the consequence of their debt? The answer to that is found in two words that are found in the Bible. Number one, the word on your outline is vengeance. Vengeance, there are two words. You see, vengeance... A definition of it would be that vengeance would be my desire to see another person suffer for the pain that they have inflicted upon me. Or we could say vengeance is my desire to hurt you because you hurt me. Well, throughout the Bible, there are all kinds of warnings on vengeance. Take these down, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17 and 18. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn his anger away from you. Or in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, as we read a few moments ago, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You see, <clears throat> this morning, think with me. Has someone committed an offense against you? Has someone at some point in your life ever committed an offense against you? Let me tell you what, what the Bible would say. The Bible would say, don't you settle the score. Let God settle the score or somebody else out there. Uh, but don't you do that because vengeance belongs 
to the Lord. We have a great story of that illustrated in the Bible. If you go back to the Old Testament in the book of 2 Samuel, you'll find the story where David, King David's predecessor, King Saul, was uh, the king who relentlessly, he pursued David. He absolutely hated David. He was incessantly jealous of David. In fact, when David was young and when David was fearless and David stood and the strength of the Lord and, and David went out there and fought Goliath by himself and killed Goliath and the women began to sing, David's slain, uh, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. From that moment on, Saul hated David. He dogged him every step of the way. He tried every way in the world to take David's life. But the day came when Saul met his own Waterloo out there on the battlefield when the Philistines were about to take Saul. King Saul fell on his own sword and committed suicide so that the Philistines would not take him. And suddenly, David was the new king. But this is the interesting thing about that story. There was an Amalekite who saw Saul fall on his sword, and so he runs to David with the news. But he changes up the story, and he lets David assume that he's the one that killed Saul and so it's like he's coming to David to say, aren't you glad I did what I did? Aren't you glad that I, that I took Saul's life? You know, maybe he thought in the new administration he would have some high position or be lauded or, or some way uh, be honored for this event. But the interesting thing about that story is there was a surprising reaction from David. David how did David respond when this Amalekite came to him? In 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11 through 16, Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so also did all the men who were with him. You see, that was a great demonstration of incredible sorrow in the life of, of King David. Verse 12 says, They mourned and wept. And fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the people of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Verse 13 and verse 14 tells us, David said to the young man, this was the Amalekite, the one that made the story up and came to David. David said to the young man who told him, where are you from? Notice what the young man answered. I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. And then in verse 14, we see David said to him, How is it you were not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? The Lord's anointed? I thought this guy by the name of Saul hated David. I thought he was trying relentlessly to do anything that he could to do away with David's life. Yes, Saul was evil. And yes, Saul was David's arch enemy. How on earth could David call Saul an anointed man? Let me tell you why he did. Because God did send an anointing on Saul. And David respected that position and so, notice what David does in verse 15. And David called one of the young men and said, Go cut him down. He's speaking about the young men that came to him that told him a lie, uh, that he was the one that killed Saul. Go cut him down. So Scripture says, so he struck him and he died. Now notice the next verse there. <clears throat> David said to him, your blood is on your head, for your mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. I have killed the Lord's anointed. Let me tell you, even though Saul 
hated David, even though Saul had hurt David, even though Saul had offended David. David refused. David refused vengeance. He refused to seek vengeance. And when justice came to Saul, David did not gloat over Saul's death. He wept and he cried and he fasted and he tore his clothes as a picture of the incredible grief that was upon him. You see, David understood that vengeance belonged to God and God alone. And God says you and I are not to seek vengeance against other people. But there's a second word in the Bible, not only vengeance, but there's the word justice. What on earth is justice? Justice is the payment that God or other people might demand from their offender. And while you and I, as Christians, are to surrender our desire to get vengeance, we can never separate or surrender our desire for justice. The Bible says over and over, that as godly people were to seek justice. Notice in Psalm chapter 82, verse 3, vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Notice Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Look at Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Let me tell you, what are we to do? We are to surrender vengeance, and we are to seek justice. Well, what's the difference between vengeance and justice on your outline if you're taking notes? Let me give you three things here to fill in. First of all, vengeance. Vengeance is our desire for retribution against our offender. Justice is the repayment that another person demands from our offender. Vengeance is our desire for retribution against our offender. Justice is the repayment another person demands from our offender. Number two, vengeance is striving to settle the debt ourselves. Justice is allowing someone else to settle that score. Thirdly, vengeance leads to bitterness always, but justice leads to healing. Vengeance and justice. We've been saying throughout our series that we've been preaching for several weeks on forgiveness, that, that we are to forgive the same way God forgives us. As Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you. You see, when you and I trust in God, He removes the eternal consequences of our sins. You and I never have to fear about being in hell separated from God because God has removed the eternal consequences of our sins, but He doesn't necessarily remove the temporary consequences of our sins. There's a difference. He doesn't necessarily remove the temporary consequences of our sins. Christians who have been forgiven, still many times we have to experience a broken marriage. Uh, sometimes we experience a severed friendship. Sometimes as a Christian we experience the consequence of a, a lost job or a life-threatening illness. You see, forgiven people still have to experience consequences in this life. So people ask the question, if I have been forgiven in my past, then why is it 
that I have to suffer the consequences when I have been forgiven. Well, maybe you've wondered that as well this morning. So the Bible gives at least three reasons there on your outline that God allows forgiven people to experience consequences for our sins. Why would God make us, if we've been forgiven and we've forgiven someone, then why would we have to suffer the consequences of our sin? Number one, consequences promote order in society. Consequences promote order in society. Maybe you've heard the story of Chichi Rodriguez, the famous golfer. I love this story. One day he was driving one of his friends uh, down the road. And they came to a yellow light, and all of a sudden, the yellow light turned red, and Chi-Chi drove right on through the red light. And the person riding with him started screaming and hollering, what on earth are you doing? You drove us right through a red light. We could have been killed. And Chi-Chi said, said, well, uh, my brother taught me how to drive. He don't stop at red lights. I don't stop at red lights. A few minutes later, same thing happened on down the road. Another yellow light came, and then the red light. Chi-Chi just went right on through it. By this time, the passenger in his car, he's screaming out again, and he's hollered. He said, please pull over. You're going to get us killed. Chi-Chi looked at him, and he said, well, my brother taught me how to drive. He don't stop at red lights. I don't stop at red lights. Third time, on down the lane, all of a sudden, they come to a a green light, and Chi-Chi slams on the brakes. He stops, and he looks in both directions. And his passenger said, what in creation are you doing? You run the red lights, and you stopped on the green lights. And Chi-Chi said, I'm looking for my brother. (laughs) Some of you will figure that out over lunch. Well, the point that I want to make about that is this. What if there were no red lights? What if there were no red lights out there? What if there were no warning signs out there? Then everybody would do that which is right in their own sight. The other day in Oklahoma City, when 86,000 people were without power, and many of the streetlights in Oklahoma City were out, and and people were coming up to the four-way stops, and lane after lane after lane of people, and and all of us were deciding who who got here first. Which one of us get to go first? And, And people were meeting out in the middle of the streets. You see, what if there were no warning signs in life? You see, if there were no warning signs in life, if there were no red lights in life, if there there were no laws, then everybody would do that which is right in their own sight. In fact, if your boss ticked you off, well, okay, I'll just go out there and kill him. Or maybe you one day are short of money. You think, well, I'll just hold somebody up and rob them today. I mean, if there are no red lights, if there are no laws out there, or maybe you look out there and you see somebody else's wife and you think they look better than the one you've got. And you just think, well, I'll just go ahead and and take her away from him. You see, what would a world be like where there are no laws, where there are no red lights? Did you know that the world was once like that? right before God sent the flood and Genesis 6. Look at what Moses said in Genesis 6, 11 and 12. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. Does that sound familiar today? And God looked on the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Notice what he said there. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. You see, God sent the great flood. And after God sent the great flood, what did God do? He established government. And God established government. Why? To maintain order in society and to impose laws upon the world. In fact... It's not done in our day and time here in America, but God intended government to legislate morality. 
The very first law that he put into effect is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. You see, the very first law on the books after the flood was capital punishment, and God expects consequences to maintain order in society. Otherwise... Everyone would do that which is right in their own sight. God uses consequences with us in the same way today. Although God may occasionally exempt you and me from experiencing the full-blown consequences of our actions, that's not the norm. God uses consequences in our lives to maintain order in our families, in our churches, and in society. A second thing on your outline about consequences. Why consequences in our lives? Number two, consequences serve as a deterrent to other people. Young people, do you know of somebody that somebody, something happened to and you looked at your life and it brought fear in your life? Let me tell you, if you go back to the book of Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 11, we're not going to read that this morning for time's sake. But in the New Testament church, young people, there, were, there was a couple. Their name was Ananias and Sapphira. And they had some property. And they went out and they sold the property. And what they did was they lied and said they gave all of the money to the church. Now, young people, it wasn't because they kept some of the money back that was the problem. The problem was Ananias and Sapphira, when they were questioned, they lied about it. And when they were confronted, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit of God moved upon their life and both of them died. And the church was deterred by what they saw. They were frightened because they saw the power of of Almighty God. Consequences serve as a deterrent to others. Thirdly and lastly, why do we have to suffer consequences, temporary consequences in this life? Because consequences inoculate you and me against further disobedience. God uses consequences to bring us back and to a right standing with him, into a right relationship with him, and keep us there. Notice what King David said in Psalm 119, verse 67. This was after he had had his adulterous affair. He had had her her husband Uriah murdered in battle, put in the front lines of the battle. He tried to cover up his sin for a year, and David wrote this psalm and said, Before... I was afflicted. I went astray. Young people, that means David, for a year, hid his sin, did not confess it to God. The Bible says that his bones waxed within him. David was in pain. David was in guilt. And it preyed upon his health. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now, but now, I keep your word. Let me tell you, if you desire forgiveness from God or other people, don't become discouraged over the lingering consequences of your sin. But let those consequences be a gift that God designed to keep you and me close to him. Will you bow and stand as we pray the model prayer one more time this morning? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.